Okay, we, we, are, we will get started now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Association of Regional Center Agencies webinar on the Self-Determination Program. My name is Darlene Dupree, and I am your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to give special recognition and a special thanks to the Integrated Community Collaborative for their partnership in getting today's PowerPoint presentations translated into Spanish for us. We really appreciate, appreciate it. So the Spanish slides for today will be available in the chat and we, we can jump right into housekeeping. So the meeting is being recorded. For Spanish interpretation, please click the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and select the Spanish channel. In the Spanish channel, you can select mute original audio if you do not want to hear the interpreter. Otherwise, you will hear the English presenters in the background. ASL interpreters will be on spotlight throughout the presentation. Depending on your device, this may mean that sometimes you cannot see the presenter. We do apologize for the inconvenience. This presentation will have English closed captioning, which can be accessed using the button at the bottom of your screen. Your video and audio will not be available. We are in webinar mode. So you will only be able to see the presenters and interpreters. Chat is not activated for attendees. Presenters may share some information through the chat during their webinar. Questions may be asked by um, accessing the Q&A feature at the bottom. The questions will be recorded and responses will be provided on a later date via website posted. Features will be based on the version of Zoom that you are using and the type of device you are using to watch the webinar. Some features such as polling are not available for phone users. If you have any questions, please email webmaster at arcanet.org. I will now turn it over for our Spanish interpreter who will go over the housekeeping rules in Spanish. For today's agenda, we will be discussing the philosophy, principle, and history of SDP, SDP from a participant's perspective, the role of the planning team and program mechanics, and the role of the local volunteer advisory committee, and we will end with the promise of SDP. I would like to introduce our speakers for today. We have Liz Harrow. She currently manages the Community Services Division at East Los Angeles Regional Center. She has 26 years of experience working in various capacities, one of which include overseeing the statewide self-determination pilot project. She is no stranger to the Regional Center system as she has worked at both Regional Center of Orange County as well as Alta California Regional Center. In addition, she's worked briefly for the Department of Developmental Services in directing the training and technical assistant management for self-determination and other special projects. Liz is a licensed clinical social worker and the youngest of four siblings, one of whom has autism. 
Our next presenter following Liz will be Charles Nutt. Charles is a self-advocate that has been served by Far Northern Regional Center since the 90s. He holds many key positions on various committees, including being the chair of Far Northern Regional Center's Self-Determination Advisory Committee. Charles has provided, uh, Charles will provide more insight into his background during his part of the presentation. Followed by Charles, we will have Antoinette. Antoinette holds a bachelor's of psychology and master's degree in clinical psychology. Since 1998, she has dedicated her career to working with various social service populations with the last 17 and a half years serving the developmental disabled community through Harbor Regional Center. She currently holds the position of a director of children and adolescent services. She has overseen Harbor's SDP program since 2017, and she chairs the statewide SDP task force for all 21 regional centers. Then we will have Lynn Stewart. He is a committee member of CVRC's local advisory committee. He has been on the committee for three years. He has been served by Central Valley Regional Center for over 50 years and is employed by CVRC as an individual advocate specialist. Part of his responsibilities include promoting the primary advisory committee. And then to round out our pre presenters for the day, we have um, Marlene, who was with us. Marlene has been working in the regional center system for 21 years. She is currently a case management supervisor at Far Northern Regional Center and has one of the managers um, and was one of the managers that helped to roll out SDP for Far Northern Regional Center. So join me in welcoming all of our presenters today and I will turn it over to Liz. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I know I only have 15 minutes, so I will do my best to cover self-determination history from pilot to law, and we can go right to the next slide. Thanks so much. And this is what I'll try and just cover as best I can during this time period, our history and philosophical background, give you a little um, information about the California pilots that go back, uh, gosh, going now on about 26 years, talk to you a little bit about what we did at ELARC, um, some of the lessons learned, and how we got to where we are today in self-determination. I know we're not going to have questions in discussion, um, so put your questions in the Q&A, because it's my understanding those will be answered and, and shared later. So we can go to the next slide. So with self-determination, um, I know we're in a place now where folks know self-determination as a program and probably have questions around things like budget and money and, and getting services and, and understanding how on earth is that all going to work. And I know other presenters are going to speak to that much better than I can at this point. My job is to kind of tell you the old history of it. But really, it's important to understand with self-determination, it really has its roots in a, in a philosophy. Um, and it really um, is really about rules being built and programs being built around a set of, of values that don't change. And ultimately, the concept of self-determination, when you think of that terminology and just remove from your mind regional centers and disability and think about self-determination, it's always meant people kind of reclaiming their citizenship. People saying, I have a right to be at the table. And what does that really mean? What responsibility does that carry? And so it's always been an international civil rights movement. The disability rights um, movement um, of the 70s into the 80s, uh, particularly in Europe, really embraced the concept of self-determination and said, how does this apply to disability rights? And started to really craft programs where people had a say in how the money uh, for their services could be more controlled by the people actually receiving the services. In the United States, that was picked up in the late 80s into the 90s. Um, the um, Robert Wood Grant, um, I'm sorry, the, the Wood found, 
blanking on the name of it, the Robert Wood Foundation uh, picked up some of the first initial work with um, self-determination in the United States. Um, remember that all states, but California, California is the only state that has the Lanterman Act. So a lot of states have struggled with providing services to folks with developmental disabilities, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and really um, things like waiting lists and how to really serve folks was a struggle for a lot of states, not necessarily California at that time. So those states really piloted the initial self-determination programs in the United States. Um, California kind of caught up um, a little bit later in the late 90s, and we'll talk about that. We can go to the next slide. So in California, it was the Lanterman Act that was amended in 1999 to include the concept of piloting self-determination. And again, as I was saying, you know, when we think about the Lanterman Act, right, the Lanterman Act is, is uh, a really explains how the regional centers work, um, and, but the really, the Lanterman Act is civil rights legislation, right? It really, it's a law that basically says, if you're born in California, and you, if you live in California, if you, if you are here, you are entitled to a meaningful life in the community. Uh, your disability should not be in the way of having that meaningful life in the community. And we have a system in California that's going to guarantee you are entitled to the services and support you need to have that meaningful life. And so that's really what the Lanterman Act is about. And that promise makes California's service delivery system different from other states. So when we started looking at, as a state, how could we use how could we blend in this concept of self-determination in with, with what was already a pretty strong civil rights legislation? That's what the pilot was about. How, does, how will that work with what's kind of known as an entitlement system? Um, and so what we did was the three, there were three regional centers named originally. That was Eastern Los Angeles Regional Center, as well as Tri-Counties and Redwood Coast. And back then, uh, terms were different. We partnered with what was called area boards. Now it's known as the state council. But I want you to notice as I tell you this history how much it aligns with how things are working today. One of the, one of the main things in the Lanterman Act, this was the first time um, uh, there was a requirement to partner with the, with the state council. And this was the first time there was the concept of a local advisory committee that the individuals served in this program would be part of an advisory committee to guide the process of these pilots. We can go to the next slide. And at the state level, there was also a steering committee. And the steering committee really was charged with really sort of, again, we were building this from scratch and knowing just conceptually what self-determination is, but thinking of California, what would it really look like? And wanting to keep it very pure and wanting to make it as responsive as possible and really allowing each of the regional centers to do self-determination in different ways, which we all did. We approached it differently, but that there would be some consistencies in how we approached it. So one of the consistencies was, Self-determination means you have a capitated budget. And that was the first big question. In a system where you have entitlements to services, how can you determine, how do you capitate a budget? How do you determine an individual budget? So we were all gonna basically pilot and experiment this. It had to be voluntary. It wasn't something people could be forced into or we would, we, you know, regional centers would have to force to change our whole way of business, but that it would be always be something voluntary. And importantly, that we'll, the POS standards, the, the policies and procedures around services, use of vendored services, that did not apply in self-determination. So that was a consistency across all of the pilots. And there were three basic rules. Whatever was purchased had to be legal, it could not cause physical harm, and it had to be related to the IPP. Only three of those three rules. So I think it's important to understand now the self-determination program that we're in now has lots of rules, right? Well, that's because it's federal funding, and that's based on what we learned through these pilot projects. So one of the things that we really, in rolling out the pilot back then, there we had to really think about new roles, and how would those work in California? And one of those roles was brokers. Now, if you know self-determination today, that's, those are the independent facilitators. Um, so we were trying to figure out how would we work with brokers. Um, and so different regional centers set that up in different ways, independent brokers. Again, now known as independent facilitators. And the use of a fiscal intermediary. We knew that there had to be that. Now that's called financial management service, right, FMS. Back then it was called a fiscal intermediary. How could the cash flow so that services and supports could be paid for. It had to stay cost neutral. That meant it couldn't cost the state more than it would if they were, people were in the traditional services. 
and there would be an evaluation by an outside consultant of these pilots. It's intended to be a three-year pilot. <laughs> so by, by the year 2002, it was supposed to go statewide. So the, evalu the evaluation by an outside consultant was due about halfway through the pilot. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so during the, oh, go back, sorry. So during the, as the pilot rolled out in those first years, uh, two regional centers joined, San Diego and Kern Regional Center. There were extensions, 2002 came around and there was still lessons to be learned. Um, there had initial been some startup funds. There were no more startup funds and DDS began to work on some evaluations of the program as well. So it, it, it kind of kept going um, into the mid 2000s. Now we can go to the next slide, thanks. And it, it kept going and as it kept going, um, we began to learn more about what was working and what wasn't working. But I wanna take a step back before I come back to the lessons learned and talk a little bit more about the concept of self-determination and other terms that sometimes um, other states will use or you may hear, but conceptually understanding self-determination, um, as I said, from a philosophical place, but also from sort of a nuts and bolts place. It can be called individualized funding. It could be called self-directed services. But the reason why self-determination is generally the accepted term is because that really melds the concept, the nuts and bolts of an individual budget from which you purchase your services and supports to that values basis, right, of being self-determined, of having a place at the table. So it's the same basic premise no matter what. An allocation of public money directly to the individual, right, or their legal representative to meet their disability-related needs. It's a pretty simple premise, actually. You can go to the next slide. And the idea here, again, looking at the philosophy and the nuts and bolts, that folks with developmental disabilities who need public support to participate fully in community life, they'll have that control over the funding in order to achieve their citizenship aspiration. I can't emphasize how much when you really look at the, the scholarly research on self-determination, when you look at self-advocates in this country and internationally speaking to self-determination and lessons learned. Conceptually, the idea of citizenship, of community, of if you're gonna be part of self-determination, you're gonna be part of your community. And that overlays with, um, on the state level, we're seeing, of course, the rollout of what's known as the home and community-based uh, services final rule. And around really use of funds that are inclusive and not segregated. And so, you can see how the foundation of self-determination as it was rolling out as a pilot really aligns with, with what we have in self-determination today. But nothing's changed about this statement. That continues to be this, the, really the objective of self-determination. We can go to the next slide. So with self-determination, originally there were four principles. A lot of you are like, wait a minute, I thought there was five. There's a reason why I'm saying four right now, because I'm the historian, right? So we can go through all of these four and then we'll talk about the fifth one. So we can go to the next slide. So freedom, really the freedom to develop a meaningful life plan right? What's a meaningful life plan? Well, that's really the ability to dream and to say, what, what, do I, what is the dream I have for myself, for my child? Um, where do I see myself? Um, where do I see my child? And then being able to say, what services and supports do I need to make that happen? Without having to think about the rules, the programs, what's available, but to dream. Now, we all eventually have to come back and say, okay, what can I do? I mean, in, in, in whether we're talking about self-determination, a regional center, or we're just talking about our day-to-day -day life, we can dream about all the places we want to go and things we want to do with our life. To have that freedom to dream allows us to be able to maybe figure out pathways to make those things happen and get the resources and supports we need to make those things happen. And sometimes we can't, but we figure out alternatives. If we don't even have the freedom to go there because we're feeling so restricted, we don't have the freedom really to have that meaningful life. And so that's an important concept. Authority, to have control over the resources necessary to implement that plan. That means having that decision-making authority to say, you know, um, I'm gonna direct these funds this way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move my funding around in order to meet this need. Really just having that ability 
that again, that, that concept of decision-making authority. We can go to the next slide. Support, this is a big one, support. Everybody needs support, right? The ability to be able to call on someone to help, to help you plan, to help find resources, and to help ensure that services are of quality. Um, and, and, you know, over the years of talking about self-determination, when it first rolled out, you know, in the late 90s, I remember folks being really worried at the regional center, um, wait a minute, does this mean we're going to go away or, or our providers are going to go away? No, people always need other people. Um, and if, 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 that's, if you've dedicated your life and you have the expertise to be able to, to serve individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, then by all means, there will still be work for you to support people. Um, it just may look different. So conceptually, that concept of support, and really in self-determination, thinking about support in different ways, the concept of the what was then broker, the independent facilitator, the concept of, of folks who maybe don't have expertise, but they know you real well, right? Your friends, your family, et cetera, to really sort of be that kind of wraparound for you and help you on developing that meaningful life plan. It just help you on thinking about what services and supports you need to get there and help you to manage those resources because there's a lot of work in that, right? Next slide, please. Responsibility, this is a big one. And this kind of, to me, is kind of in two ways. Um, one is, is really about um, the responsibility with decision-making and choice-making. And this is a paradigm shift, right? Um, because to some degree, um, you know, uh, our traditional system has, has really um, had the professionals kind of taking responsibility a lot. Um, and so the idea of shared responsibility is a paradigm shift for those of us that are professionals, those of us that are family members, right? Or, the, or our individuals that are served by a regional center. So really that responsibility to, to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this decision and I'm gonna live with it. Basically I'm gonna, or, or if I need to change things, I'm gonna be the one to, to speak up about that. We're gonna work together on that. This responsibility to contribute to your community. Remember with self-determination, the idea here is it's rooted in being a, having a place at the table of reclaiming citizenship. So contributing to your community, being part of and included in your community. And responsibility because these are taxpayer dollars. These are federal and state dollars. And so really having to take responsibility for spending those in a way that truly um, is wise spending of those dollars and be good stewards. We can go to the next one. So there is a fifth principle, and, but it wasn't added until the year 2000. Um, and that was through, there was a couple of big conferences, um, international self-determination conference. There was a national one in Seattle. Some of us were um, fortunate enough to go to that. And at that time there was all the buzz about adding the fifth principle. And it was so beautiful because it was really individuals served um, from states that had been doing it uh, for a while, like New Jersey. Uh, I remember in particular some um, individuals served really talking about this concept of adding the fifth principle of confirmation, right? Confirmation it really means just nothing about me without me. It's recognizing that everybody has a leadership role in this model of service delivery and everybody should have a seat at the table, not just at their personal table, um, their planning table, but at, the, but at the planning table for the implementation of this, for the planning table for the vision of where it's gonna be in 20 years, which is where we're at now, 20 years from now in 2040, right? It really speaks to, to, to me, it speaks to in California, the concept of the local volunteer advisory committee. And I know someone's gonna talk about that later, but really the concept of, I have a place at the table um, and I have a, play a leadership role. It's really baked into self-determination. We can go to the next slide. Um, so I will briefly speak about our project at Eastern Los Angeles Regional Center because it was so long ago. I was just, I just moved into this office and had some things put in and, and I was pulling out at that table behind me was covered yesterday actually or two days ago with old binders from 1998, 1999, self-determination, dusting them off. It's a long time ago now. And we were a smaller regional center then. Um, we, we had um, 5,000 individuals that were served. We now have actually over 13,000. But back then, um, our local volunteer advisory committee, they were just called the advisory committee back then, decided how we'd implemented at our regional center. Remember, every regional center that was a pilot did it differently. And we wanted to focus. So we talked about four target groups. We were going to focus on reaching out to parents of children with autism, 
parents of children with medical needs, adults 22 to 35, kind of transitioning, and adults 35 and over with those aging parents. And I do have to say, particularly the children with medical needs and the adults 35 and over, we were looking at our non-English speaking um, families. We wrote, a, we, our regional center at that time, we, we was the lowest per capita purchase of service. Um, and we wrote into our project back then that we saw self-determination as a way to really address disparity um, and, and really wanting to use this to create equity uh, across our system. We can go ahead to the next slide. So of those 5,000 people we served back then, about half of them met those criteria, and we threw open information sessions, and we had so many people attend. Um, and of those folks that attended, we had 162 that said, yeah, I'm interested in this thing, because we were like, this could be a pilot. We don't know what's going to happen. You want to try it with us? Um, and so basically, we did a random stratified um, selection out of those 162, and we ended up with four groups. And those four groups, eight people each, 32 participants to become our pilot. We can go to the next slide. And again, the purpose of our project, we were really focused on, on serving our entire community. Um, you know, people think Eastern, in fact, people often say East LA Regional Center. We are Eastern Los Angeles Regional Center. We serve part of Eastern Los Angeles County. And so, yes, we do serve East LA and people associate that with a, a large Latino population, which is absolutely true. We also have a very large Asian American uh, community. We serve Monterey Park, Alhambra, San Gabriel. We also have one of the most wealthy communities in the entire world. We serve San Marino. Um, we serve South Pasadena. Um, so we are very diverse and we wanted to really capture that in this pilot with these 32 folks. Back then, we assigned it to one service coordinator. This was a lowered caseload. They only had 32. We did have participants sign an agreement. Um, the brokers were available. Independent facilitators were a choice. People did not have to have an independent facilitator or broker. Some of the other pilot regional centers assigned brokers to folks. So we did it all did it differently. And at our regional center, we split the FMS, the fiscal intermediary. We actually kept the bill paying at the regional center. So that function of just paying for services we just continued to do that at the regional center. We had to set up a whole other system, but we can't continue that. But if individuals wanted to hire their own staff to work for them, well, then they would need to use what was called a fiscal intermediary, what's now called an FMS. And so we did contract with FMSs back then. We can go to the next slide. We did have a crisis plan, ongoing technical support. We had to learn new forms, new procedures, new roles, all the stuff that's been going on with this rollout of self-determination. And we recognized there was a ton of training needed for participants, for the brokers, and for our community. And we, it took us uh, quite a while. We were the first regional center uh, in California to, to have somebody actually have their uh, um, person-centered plan, their IPP, and their budget set up. That person, I'm not going to say her name because that's her story to share, but she was served by our regional center. It took us quite a while to get there because <laughs> it, it was a couple of months of, of figuring out what to do. And, and again, we learned together very much in partnership with the folks that we serve. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. How did we build the budget? Oh, we can go back. Um, how did we, do, so our challenge at our regional center, we really wanted to figure out how could, because remember each regional center says pilots and experiment. How do you make a fair individual budget? And at our regional center, I want you to remember what I said all along. We had people that we knew there wasn't a lot of money spent on. We had people we knew were low per capita. So how do you, if you just make it a straight historical budget, that wasn't going to be fair in our view at that time. We were like, this isn't going to be fair. So what we did was we looked at, individual costs for you as an and for people like you. So remember, we had target areas. So we could say, how much did this agency spend on all children between age three and 18 who have autism? And how much did we spend on you? And that was a range. And if you were a participant, that range was presented to you. And then your person-centered IPP was developed. And then your budget would and your budget was determined based on that, and you were asked to stay in in that range. So that way, folks that maybe had a lower per capita were able to lower budget historically were able to really rise up. And we didn't have people who maybe had higher exceeding what had been spent on them. Thus, trying to keep it cost neutral, right? Okay, so we can go to the next um, slide. So this basically says what I just said. 
<laughs> so we can go to the next slide. Okay, so what do, what do we learn from these projects? Well, because the project was only supposed to be 30 years, three years, but it went on for, for not 30 years, but, but a solid extra decade and a half, um, people were so satisfied. Our self-determination project um, uh, participants, it was bumpy and, and they, you know, things took longer and we would change things along the way, but um, people were ultimately very satisfied once things settled in and they were really going with self-determination. What happened was POS costs tended to be neutral to less on average. After the first five years, you really saw a flattening out, whereas in traditional services, um, if you look at people, the, the costs were still going up. There was a lot of money spent in the first couple of years, people um, buying equipment. Um, and one of our target groups you'll remember was medical. And so we did see a little bit of a bump there. And we also learned that people tended to continue to use traditional services, except in our case of supported living. We did have a lot of folks who decided to hire their own staff if they'd had supported living. We can go to the next slide. Um, it took a lot of time to plan. Lots of time was needed for planning. People need training, lots of training and support. Um, there, we need to keep an eye on the quality of services as a team and figure out how to do that and enlist really working on a partnership with the professionals and the individuals served to ensure that there's quality and health and safety needs are met. Tracking budgets can be challenging. Um, and it didn't work for everybody. Some people said it's just too complicated. I can't do this. And that's fine. Most of the people stuck with it. And we learned that regional centers can do this. It was always our recommendation in East LA to go ahead and please, let's make this happen. Okay, let's go on. Um, so just on the history, just very quickly here, as it rolled out, there were a couple of times where the state of California tried to expand it. Um, there was something called self-directed services. I think that still shows up in the Lanterman Act. Um, and uh, that did not really take off. Um, you'll recall these, these, you're looking at a time when the California was having heading towards its extreme budget crisis here. About 2010-ish, I'd say here, there was something called individual choice budget um, that also did not take off. We can go to the next slide. When did self-determination really take off? Um, because that pilot was just kind of puttering along and we were working hard and trying to make it happen. You know when it took off? It took off just in alignment with what I told you about the concept of nothing about me without me. Um, and really this always being sort of a grassroots human rights, civil rights kind of thing. It took off when parents and individuals served said, we want this to happen. We are, we are taking this to the top. And so a group of parents um, specifically and, and advocates um, really um, worked hard to have legislation passed, uh, Senate Bill 468 back now 10 years ago that said self-determination, it's time. It's time for this to finally roll out statewide and set some very specific parameters. And so um, as that happened, as the state then took that on, had to get the federal approval, um, the waiver for the federal dollars was approved about five years later, and that gets us pretty much to today about, you know, there was the soft rollout and then it became open enrollment for everybody. So that is my, hopefully I stayed on track with my time, um, very quick overview on the history and philosophy, and I'm going to give it over to you, Charles. Thanks so much. Oh, I'm Charles. I'm, I'm a self-advocate. I have a, a press. A PowerPoint presentation to show up my um, experience with um, self determination. Let me tell you a little bit about my me. I'm a, on a lot of volunteer work. It's my passion. I'm the chair of Farmer Regional Center Self Determination Advisory Committee. I'm the chair of the North State Regional Advisory Committee. I'm the chair of the statewide self advocacy network. I'm the secretary Department of Development and Disabilities Consumer Advisory Committee. I also belong to self-advocates for emergency education and leaders empowering self-advocates. I also co-train and tell my experience of self-determination for the State Council on Development and Disabilities through, through orientations for self-determination. My, my, journey, my journey through with self-determination, I'm on my third year of self-determination. 
My first year I worked on health and safety. My second year I worked on self on employment. And my third year I'm working on employment and community participation. My first year of self-determination. Through self-determination, I worked on my health and wellness. I was able to purchase through my funds a Nord track, exercise bike, and both legs. I was able to lose the need, need to wait for a surgery. The second year, I worked on employment. I was able to purchase a computer, printer, scanner, and a file cabinet. And I had unmet needs of the camp for my insurance. My was maxed out. I was able to use my self determination and purchase crowns and fillings for my teeth. My third year, I just started on my third year. My goal is to go back to live meetings and it has not yet started, but I have a plan in place for transportation and to and from my meetings. That way I can be a success with my committees. With my staff, I also was able to hire my own staff through my self-determination. I was able to hire my independent living skills instructor through a vendor for more pay and less money than it costs for the research center to pay for our vendor. I'm in the driver's seat. I like how I'm in the driver's seat. What I mean by that is I get to choose what I want and how to make it myself successful and what to do with my volunteer positions. I really like the self determination system. Thank you. All right. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. As Darlene mentioned, I uh, currently oversee Harbor Regional Center Self-Determination Program. Um, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to share a bit about the SDP program mechanics and the role of the planning team. You know, SDP is or can be uh, very complicated for some people. And I hope to give information in a bite-sized way so that I, you leave this webinar feeling like you can use what you learned. Um, and you can see on the slide that you just went to, Darlene. Um, over the next dozen or so slides, we will go over the key components of SDP, as well as discuss the different roles and responsibilities within each component. Um, and those components are orientation, pre-enrollment transition supports, independent facilitator, individual budgets, spending plans, financial management services, and going live. Next slide. So um, of course, uh, the most important person in the planning team is the potential participant or the participant. Um, you know, they are at the center of the planning through the person-centered planning process, which I will talk a bit more about in a bit. Um, also is the circle of support. Now, what is the circle of support? That is really anyone that the individual feels can speak to their best interests or needs. Um, this can include a network of friends, family, professionals, paid workers, community members, and others to help make decisions, help plan, help find resources, and ensure quality of services. Also, um, there may be an independent facilitator, which I will explain a little bit more about later. Um, and uh, this person, in essence, will help create a vision of ideal future and outline a plan with detailed steps to make it all happen. Um, and then also involved in the process is the regional center. Um, the regional center connects participants to generic or publicly funded resources. Um, they provide service coordination. They facilitate STP orientations. They certify budgets. They review spending plans, ensure compliance with HCVS and federal rules. All of this stuff I'll talk in more detail about as we progress in the slides. Next slide. So uh, one of the requirements or things that must happen in the program is that each potential participant must attend an orientation. The orientation will give the potential participant information about roles, responsibilities. It will dispel or you know, kind of get rid of any myths or, and clarify facts about the program and ultimately help the individual decide if SDP is for them. Each regional center provides their own orientation and the orientations may have a different feel uh, or unique details for a given center. The orientation can be in person, via Zoom, or through a pre-recorded module. <clears throat> Many centers will honor an orientation that an individual receives from another regional center or another entity. For example, a Harbor client may want to drop in 
on the orientation that San Diego is having. The SE would just need to confirm with San Diego uh, Regional Center that Harbor's uh, person attended. Now, orientations are also provided by the State Council on Developmental Disabilities in different languages. And you can find information about that um, through your regional center or through the State Council uh, on Disability, uh, Developmental Disabilities website. Okay, next slide. Right now, there are two pathways or options to help a potential participant get live status, which I will explain a bit later. DDS has given regional centers the authority to cover the cost of a plan development for up to 2,500, known as option A, which is on the slide. Anything above that would require direct approval from DDS. Another option, and this is a newer option, is option B, in which regional center can pay up to 1,000 for the initial person-centered plan development and up to 40 hours of coaching supports from an IF um, and or NFMS. As, um, once July 1st, 2023 comes, which is right around the corner, only option B will be available for participants, okay? Option uh, one will, uh, or option A will no longer exist, okay? So next slide. So very important in SDP, but not required, is the development of a person-centered plan uh, that I briefly talked about in the previous slide. This is different than the plans developed with the regional center. Although regional centers stand behind our plans and believe that we always take a person-centered approach when developing an individual person-centered plan or IPP, for SDP, the person-centered plans um, are more comprehensive or detailed and is considered a staple or main ingredient of SDP. And that is why DDS has dedicated money to help a part potential participant have one completed. Not all participants choose to have an independent pers uh, person-centered plan developed. Some may choose to do it themselves and others may choose to work with the document developed by the regional center. And when they choose to have one done, this person is considered an independent facilitator. Uh, and their role is very important, uh, um, is that, uh, and their role is to provide um, support to the family, locate, access, and coordinate the services and supports in the participant's IPP, uh, lead, participate, or advocate on the behalf of the participants. Um, and you know they are paid out of the individual's budget. So it's very important to know that the regional center cannot like increase the budget for that purpose. It has to come out of the existing budget. Next slide. Now, every participant of STP will have an individual budget. Basically, the individual budget is a dollar amount for them to coordinate services and supports over a 12-month period. Regional centers are responsible for establishing each participant's budget and certifying, right, approving or, you know, saying it's correct that the dollar amount would have been spent if the individual remained in traditional services. There is a section of the Lanterman Act, Welfare and Institutions Code 4685.8, that speaks to that. Regional centers cannot, as I mentioned earlier, increase the budget to cover the cost. Next slide. Oh, no, one more thing, sorry. sorry. <laughs> of course, just, uh, just like an IPP in traditional services, the budget can be amended so it can change. It's not fixed. Uh, so if there are new needs that are identified, it can be increased or um, something's no longer needed, it can be decreased. Um, so, um, you know, so it's not, you know, one budget, that's what you get. It can be adjusted based on the need. Next slide. Now, currently there are five service areas that are coordinated outside of the participant's budget. And that's uh, cost related to uh, insurance funded services, such as co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles. Uh, if you're accessing the com competitive and integrated employment in incentives, that's also handled outside of the budget. Um, paid internship program is outside of the budget. Any rental assistance or SSI or SSP payments as well are handed uh, outside of the budget. Next slide. So, um, so how it looks when we're working together, the regional center and the participant, is you know the regional when we're looking at the budget, the regional center develops the budget using a 12 month period of the the previous expenditures, and um, they certify it and they give a copy to the participant for review. The participant reviews the budget, agrees to the budget, and if not 
in agreement can revisit the budget with the regional center and also access their due process rights. Okay. Next slide. Now, the spending plan lays out how the dollar amount in an individual's budget will be spent. It lists the services, the provider and dollar amount allocated to each specific service and support that will help the individual achieve their goals. Regional centers do not assist with developing it, this. The participant and their circle of support, or if they choose an independent facilitator, um, they will work on this, okay? So this is basically your spending plan is now, I've been given this money in my individual budget, and now how am I gonna use it, okay? Next slide. So what it looks like when we're working together, the regional center and the participant, so the regional center is reviewing the participant's completed spending plan. So even though the participant creates the spending plan, uh, the regional center still needs to review it and ensure that uh, it meets all the, the federal requirements. Um, and we also need to, if it meets the requirements, coordinate the funding so that the participant can access the services. Now the participant and the family, again, they're choosing who they wanna work with, you know, what the service is gonna look like, and documented that in the spending plan and giving the regional center the, a copy of the spending plan. Next slide. So, so this is a big one. This is very important. It's the home and community-based services, the final rule. Um, the HCBS final rule, which was issued in January of 2014, it uh, promotes integration and inclusion and providers must become compliant by March uh, 2023. But in SDP, providers have had to be compliant since the beginning. Um, and uh, in order for the service to be authorized in the spending plan, they have to meet the requirements that are listed in the HCBS. You know, DDS uh, offered some guidance in March of this year, sharing assessment tools that can be used to assess the provider's compliance with the final rule. Uh, next slide. Okay, so... The financial management service is the only required service for a participant in SDP. They handle the business aspect of things. So managing the budget, doing background checks for potential providers. And um, so there are different models of how uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the financial management person will, uh, services will look and we'll go over that in the next slide. So, Bill, play, bill player pair, it's the least expensive and least amount of liability on the participant. FMS pays the provider directly. The sole employer, the participant is the provider's actual employer. There's an increase in liability here for the participant and the participant will have to obtain liability insurance. The other model, the last model is uh, the co-employer, which is a combination of the two with both participant and FMS acting as an employer, but the FMS does have, do some of the heavy lifting on liability. Uh, we know there is a statewide shortage with FMS and it has everyone's attention. Everyone is working really hard to find some solutions. Next slide. Okay, so what this looks like when we're working together is that the regional center confirms with the FMS participants live date, so we have to communicate to the FMS agency as to when the participant is going live. We have to create a purchase of service in the system uh, to put the funds there for the FMS agency to access. And we have to a, create a spending plan, I mean, a, a purchase of service for the actual spending plan as well. Now the participant, they are you know, responsible for selecting the FMS agency and FMS model, and they complete all the necessary paperwork for enrollment. They communicate expected live date with the regional center. So the participant is the one telling us when they're ready to go live, okay? Next slide. Lastly, what everyone likes to hear is that a participant has gone live in the program. This means the participant no longer is part of the traditional service delivery system and is fully operating an SDP. Some will be placed on the SDP waiver while others remain on another waiver, depending on their circumstance. This requires communication between the regional center and DDS. Thank you. And next you will hear about the role of the local volunteer advisory committee. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone. My name is Glenn Stewart. 
I'm an individual advocate specialist for Central Valley Regional Center. Uh, my co-staff is Maria Clausen. She is a participant choice specialist. She's been there since the beginning of SCP. My role as a local advisory, local volunteer advisory committee is to go out in the community to, uh, to share about what self-determination is, uh, to, to do outreaches, uh, to, to do uh, STP orientation. And I also attend the local volunteer advisory committee, which we meet once a month. Currently, that we have uh, 119 individuals who trans transition from, from general services until uh, STP. By the way, that I'm glad that baseball started today. I'm a huge San Francisco Giant fan. And so back to, and also our obligation is, and CBRC also is working on um, STP uh, website that, that for we will post upcoming meetings, trainings, outreaches. Uh, we do have Spanish. We do have Hmong, and we do a lot of outreaches. And the last thing I want to say is that we are open to the public, and we all uh, we got training coming up. Um, uh, independent facilitator trainings coming up. We we got different kind of trainings coming up. If you look on uh, to the CBRC website, Maria, can you walk me through how, how to check that out for me? Sure, if you um, go on to the cvrc.org website, if you click the yellow tab, which says person served, you can pull down the menu on self-determination, um, and then you will see trainings and resources that we are currently providing. We just spend a lot of money on uh, individuals who transition from uh, general services to STP. Uh, we do have some individuals who started their own businesses, and we do have some people uh, want to stay with the day programs. So our our individuals, they're happy with the services. We got more in the works, and thank you very much. Hi, I'm Marlene McCollum with Far Northern Regional Center, uh, and I get the honor of talking about the promise of self-determination. Everyone before me got to talk about the nuts and bolts, and I'm really pleased I get to talk about the fun parts of self-determination. And if you go, you can skip the next slide and go right to the third, and I'll help keep us on time. All right. So we love self-determination at uh, Far Northern for a few reasons. The first reason is that we're pretty rural. Um, some of the towns that we support, there's less than 100 people living in that area. And they're closer to other states than they are to any services in California. So the self-determination program provides so many options for accessing supports in your community where you live when you don't live in a large uh, place with lots of service options. The other thing that we really love about self-determination is that it offers a way to provide culturally appropriate services. So if it doesn't make sense in your family to buy respite, because you have other family members living in your family home who can provide that free to you, uh, there might be other supports that you could put those dollars to. And self-determination really allows you the freedom to do that. Something else we really like is that um, when the support service you need doesn't exist in traditional services, you can create it in self-determination. That has been really huge in our region. 
because as I mentioned, we're rural and pretty small. And uh, a lot of what we need just simply doesn't exist. So we have to always be creating things and self-determination provides us a really easy way to do that. Uh, the services and supports are provided in your own community. Uh, Liz talked about that, really supporting people and in, in, um, retaking their citizenship and having community life at the beginning of this presentation. And that is really one of the things we especially love about the program. And then it offers freedom and choice. You get a lot more options with self-determination than you do in traditional services. Um, so we really like that about the program. Next slide, please. So these are things that some of the families in our region have said about self-determination. So I know you're gonna get a copy of the PowerPoint. I'll let you read that later. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> I mentioned that one of the things we really like is supporting people in rural areas. So this young boy's story, his name is Carson, and we have permission to share his story with you. Um, Carson lives in a town of 446 people, and he is about 15 miles from the Nevada border, and he's about 75 miles from a population center in California, and that population center would be about 900 people. So to be in a place over 1,000 people in California, the family would have to go 150 miles to get services to give you an idea about how rural they are. And when Carson was in traditional services, the regional center did two things for the family. Monthly, we shipped bibs to his family um, that Carson used to wear, and uh, we provided respite. Carson never actually got respite services because the agency providing the respite was 75 miles away and no workers wanted to drive to his house to provide the respite, but it was authorized. He had access to it in theory. So in self-determination, it's been absolutely amazing for the family. He's part of an archery club um, that he joined uh, and takes lessons at and participates and competes on the team now. Um, and I always tell people, he did not buy the quad in self-determination, he had the quad. But what he did in self-determination that's really cool is he used his funds, his family used the funds to create, you can see he's on a gravel path. Um, you can't tell in this photograph, but, but this particular town is very hilly. And so the family lives on a really steep property. And so what they did is they created a flat ring around their driveway, making it accessible for him so that he could ride his quad, or he also has a three-wheel bike that he rides. Um, and the cool thing is it's become the place in the neighborhood where all the kids go to ride their bikes because it's the only place in the neighborhood where you can. So uh, it's, it's just really been transformative self-determination has for this family um, because Traditional services, because of where they lived, just really weren't able to meet the needs. The, the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, this, this young uh, boy, he's, he's closer to a man now. Uh, it doesn't make sense for him to be wearing bibs, right? After about the age of three, wearing a bib is really not something that we do. Um, and so he's moved from the bibs. He buys those little... Uh, kerchiefs that are around his neck. So you can see he's wearing the brown handkerchief there around his neck and he wears that instead of a bib. Uh, and I think that that makes him feel a lot better when he's at the archery club or out with friends uh, just because people don't even really notice it. Uh, it's just kind of his style. Next slide, please. In terms of supporting diversity, the self-determination program can really support diversity in a couple of different ways. The most obvious way is that you have so much more flexibility in your rate structure because you determine how much money you want to pay for a particular support. You can pay extra money if that means you can have staff who have specialized skills. 
like speaking your language. So in traditional services, we have a real shortage of bilingual service providers because the rate structure in traditional services does not allow uh, providers to pay bilingual staff more uh, to provide that support. As we're in self-determination, we have found that families can actually pay a little bit more and then actually have staff who speak, speak the same language. The other thing is that it opens up things that families can buy. So in addition to being able to buy supports from someone who speaks your language, um, instead of going to the local recreation district and you know, signing up for T-ball, you could actually sign your child up for um, dance lessons that are culturally specific to you. We have um, a young child who is American Indian and he and his family are paying for dance lessons for him to learn the dances specific to his culture. So um, it just really opens up those possibilities uh, in terms of supporting diversity. Next slide. Okay, this is one of my favorites. Uh, the other thing that we really like is you can get incredibly creative uh, with the services that you provide. Uh, in our region, we've had a number of wildfires, as many of you have also experienced, and other climate disasters. Um, that have been devastating to our region. And one of the unfortunate downsides of that has been the loss of traditional services. Uh, in the county that I work in, which is Butte County, um, after the campfire, we lost seven residential facilities. So, so probably about 60 people lost their homes um, and those were never rebuilt. Uh, we lost two programs that supported people who have exceptional behavior and one program that supported people who have self-care needs. So what that means is that right now in Butte County in our traditional service offerings, there are no programs to support people who have exceptional behavior needs or who need any support with mobility or assistance using the restroom. So we've used self-determination to fill that void uh, because we can do a lot of awesome things. Ian's family, um, Ian is a guy, he really likes to be out doing things in his community. And when he was able to go to day program, he spent all of his time out doing stuff. Uh, he was part of different volunteer groups. He had uh, friends that he went out to eat with. He's got a girlfriend that he spends time with. Um, and after the fire, that program just didn't exist anymore. So uh, what Ian's family did, which I find wildly creative, is they bought themselves a van from the program that had burned down, one of the vans that, that wasn't lost. Um, and with their self-determination funds, they had the, fan, the van retrofitted. So it's a mobile changing station. So now... Ian's self-determination staff takes him to do all of the things that he used to do in day program. Uh, and wherever he goes, he has an accessible uh, changing space, which has made just a huge difference. So there's nowhere he can't go um, as long as his van fits. So it's really nice. The other nice thing I'll say about that is that Ian's mom is older and so when they were retrofitting, they made everything so that Ian can just slide onto the changing table uh, and his mom doesn't have to do any lifting. Um, so uh, that has been a huge help for her. She's, his mom is in her mid seventies and she is a very petite woman. So uh, being able to just slide Ian onto the changing table has been really huge. Um, that way Ian doesn't get hurt and his mom doesn't get hurt. So um, we love the out of the box thinking. Next slide. There definitely are challenges. I, I feel like the folks before me have done a really good job of talking about the things that can go wrong or where you have to put work in. This is a program that requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of work um, on the part of the regional center. It requires a lot of work 
uh, on from the participant or their family. Um, there's a lot of work for folks who have independent facilitators, and there's then a lot of work uh, getting services purchased and uh, paid for. That can be difficult, even after enrollment. Um, buying services can be a cumbersome process depending on what the financial management service needs from you. You might have to submit a purchase request a couple of times. You might have to submit um, uh, an invoice a couple of times before it has all of the information that you need. All right, thank you. Thank everyone for your time. I know we are a little over. Really appreciate the presenters today. If you're interested in learning more about SDP, please contact your local regional center. They will be able to assist you from there. They can also uh, give you uh, information regarding the SDP orientations. Again, the um, information will be posted on our website. So all of the PowerPoint presentations for today have been dropped in the link, but they also will be posted on ARCA's website um, and all of the questions in the QA, uh, uh, in the, uh, the question and answer session will be reviewed um, and we will develop frequently asked questions. Thank you for your time and have a good day.